Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 72. We're back! After an unplanned pause due to the pandemic and other things, uh, we're gonna go back and start doing these podcasts again. The time has kind of wafted by weirdly. I don't. Time got very weird during the pandemic, uh, and we didn't plan to pause the podcast, but there wasn't as much gaming going on, not seeing certain people, and really this podcast has always been about kind of those after-game discussions, so when we didn't have as many after-game discussions, or we got, in some cases, into playing similar games over and over uh, that we'd already discussed, uh, I don't know, it just kind of faded away, and I'd rather take a break than put out something half-hearted that drove me mad. So, we took a break, but we're back, and we're going to do our top, my top, 100 Games 2020 edition. Also, Orion's here. Hello. Sorry, I forgot to introduce Orion. I just rambled on about time and the nature of existence, uh, and forgot to say that Orion is here. But we haven't done a top 100 games podcast in two years, which is probably the pattern I'll keep on doing every two years. But here we are. We're doing it now. And Orion hasn't seen any of the list. Nope. I'm going in blind. I'm told there are changes. Some games went up. Some games went down. Mark has spreadsheets detailing all of this. I, I just counted, and actually there are 44 new games. There you go. Almost half the list is new. A lot of uh, turnover. For our patron Mark of watching us, the number one is not My Little Pony Monopoly, but good guess. Um, in Maybe. fact, I think I've spoiled the number one. I think I've mentioned it at least in articles or in podcasts from a few months ago. If it's the last number one you told me, then I know what you're thinking, but okay. I don't know if it's Okay, then changed. you probably know what it is. Okay. The top of the list did not change a lot. Like, in the last two years, I haven't gotten... I don't think there's any new games in the top ten. There are new entries in the top ten. Or not new entries, but like games that have risen into the top ten. And I believe there are a couple in the 10 to 20 section that are brand new. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's pretty high. I mean, I don't tend to move around a lot. I like to, my scores remain fairly consistent. As I've done last time, or as I at least did last time in the 2018 one, what I did is I went through all my rankings, or at least the, the games that are reasonably going to be on the list. I adjusted based on uh, current preferences and memories of the games uh a rating here and there uh so my my 1 to 10 ratings on board game geek and uh once i felt good about each game's rating i then took each subsection so each half point so like i started with the 8s uh, 8 out of 10 games and i went to the pub meeple ranking engine and used that to sort between each group or within each group rather uh, that's how I did it. It took a little while, especially there were a lot of eights, eight out of tens was the biggest group. Cause obviously it, it's a fairly, it's not a normal distribution, but it's, it's somewhat close to a normal distribution peaking at around seven. So eight's still a big chunk. There's way fewer eight and a half nines and nine and a halves. Uh, but every game on this list will be ranked at, or rated at, by me at least eight and above, and it will not be all the eights and aboves, although it is most of them. Uh, just so if people are, are number nerds like I am about this thing and like ranking things, that's how it's sorted out. In the past, I believe the first two lists had, even in the top 50, had some seven and a half rated games. But I've played enough good games now where only games I've rated eight and above are making the list, which, is, which feels better to me uh, for a top of all time list. But yeah, that's yeah, how it I should did. a top whatever should be in the top twenty percent of games. Yeah, it's definitely the top twenty percent. I've played way more than five hundred games now. I'm I'm pretty sure. Mark says uh, that eight is his. It's a good game rating. I'm trying to get away from that. I'm trying to rate where if I think yeah that was good, you know I'd play it again, but I'm not going to rush out to play it. I'd rather have that around the sixes, and I'd rather have eight out of 10 B games, I think are quite good. Yeah, nine, th nine and above is like top tier, outstanding, amazing. I think at some point I'm going to add little descriptors to my scores, uh, where anything nine and above is like outstanding or excellent. And then eight and above is great. Seven and above is good. And six and above is, or six to seven is not bad. 
I think is how I've decided on that. I've tried to expand my rating a little bit because it's easy to just put anything that was kind of good. I enjoyed it. Anything close to that, it'd be like, eh, that's a seven. That just feels like the easiest number to just Oh, pick. sure. Yeah. The seven is, uh, is, I don't know, the seven in the public consciousness as a rating yeah. has become kind of a thing where it's like, it's good. It's above average uh, right. or, or something, which is fine if you mean that. But if you're actually trying to capture a full range from bad to average to good, then you should maybe consider using fives and sixes sometimes. Well, that's the distinction. I've, I've actually debated this or discussed this in the past is on a one to ten scale, are you putting the middle? So technically it's five and a half in a one to ten scale. Is the middle an average game or is it an okay game? Because in our world of modern board games, the average game is actually good. Right. Like it is a fun game to play. Right. The If you take the... <laughs> At least a, a population of games that we have played or would consider playing, it's not going to be normally distributed on a five if we're really ranking, you know, every yeah. possible rating. So, yeah, and I think that's, I mean, that's good for the health. I mean, there are a lot of good games being made. From what I've understood from people talking, if you're playing, you know, Euro games back in the late 90s, early 2000s, maybe the average was like an okay game and there were some outliers, but like, Many games that we see in, you know, if you took a random game from like the hobbyist board game scene, it's probably going to be pretty good. Um, so I think the top of my bell curve being around six and a half to seven seems right with my experience in terms of like, yeah, the, the, the median game is pretty good. Yep. There you go. Feel free, fr feel free to tell Mark why he's wrong. I mean, it would be interesting to try to like curve, grade, like grade it on a curve where you force the average game to be five and a half, and then see what happens. I don't know what the math would look like for that, but it, you you'd, could force the curve over. You'd have to end up re-rating games because as things slotted in above or below, the average game of your experience would change. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. I think it's interesting how different people can analyze ratings. This one seems at least most helpful to me, but I don't think there's any right answer to this. I'm, I'm just explaining how I came up with it. But yeah, the last few months have been weird. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, f I feel like my life and maybe probably your life hasn't changed as much as other people's since we work from home. Largely, I, I was going out to teach debate, uh, but that pretty easily shifted over to video calls. But my motivation to play games dropped a lot. I fell behind on a lot of things, uh, both with games and outside of games. And we weren't seeing, you know, for a while there, we weren't seeing as many people at all, even our close friends that play games. We've since started up our normal game nights with the exception of one friend, with the exception of Matt, who's still quarantining largely. But yeah, I don't know. It's been an, it's been, I think this is shared by many people around that the pandemic has, for some people, it seems to have accelerated their game playing because they do it all online now, but I cannot get nearly as excited about playing a game online as I can in person. And that's kind of dropped off a bit. Yeah, I've definitely realized how much I value the social part of board gaming. And there's something that Getting around a table and playing a game together is just fundamentally different for me than playing the same game online, e even in a good implementation. Um, and when I play online, I tend to prefer some sort of video game where the computer is doing a lot more calculations for me and I can either play something more visually interesting or strategically complex or, or, some, or a completely different genre. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just that's how it kind of happened for us. Yeah, and and I used to scoff a bit at the idea of like, you know, this like board games or social games and their social experiences, that kind of argument. You see that a lot coming from Shut Up and Sit Down because they're very social. Like they're they're they seem to be fairly extroverted at least at around the table and they tend to like more party style games than we do, whereas we're we're perfectly fine playing a game where everyone sits and stares at their player board for 5 minutes during a critical point in the game. But I think there's something we said that even sitting around not talking to each other and simultaneously thinking is kind of a social thing for us that has a lot of value. 
we also tend to be pretty introverted people, so we are, as on the whole, generally okay not talking constantly. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, you don't have to be loud and and excitable to be social with board gaming. It can be any kind of thing. There's just some, I think there's some inherent value about being physically near people. And I think there's psychology, psychological research to back that up. Yeah. I haven't read on it, but I would believe it. Yeah. Anyways, let's get to the games. So how I'm doing this is I will, unlike our previous top 100, because we've talked about some of these games a lot, I, we will not be discussing in detail every game. I w- will be mentioning every game and their uh, ranking on the list, but some of them, if we talked about them a lot, we'll skip over. The new ones I will highlight and the ones that moved a lot. How I did it is I, I calculated how much any game moved up or down the list and also kind of how much any game that was previously on the list moved up or down relative to the games that were already there. So in other words, if a game moved down 20 spots, but there are 24 new games in front of them, that's kind of like they moved up four spots in some sense. Uh, So anyways, I have those numbers in case people find them interesting. I find them interesting, but without further ado, let's look at number 100, which is actually a new game, Air, Land, and Sea. A little card game in the battle line, Hanabi Koji kind of genre uh, that puts some fun twists on it in terms of like two players looking at each other, playing cards back and forth into these columns, and then trying to defeat the other player through whatever means. The the key th- twist in Airland and Sea is that you can retreat at any time and give your opponent fewer points than if they had won outright. So there's that question of retreating. Uh, Yeah. You like this one, right? I enjoyed this one. I think I was introduced to this by a friend, Kimberly, and then showed it to you and said, this is a pretty good two-player game. And I think you might like it more than I did, but I thought it was a solid two-player, fairly quick battle game. Um, Pretty interesting. I think once you've played through it a couple times... You have to like this style of game to want to keep playing it because you kind of get the different interactions and then it's a matter of uh, playing your hand out to the best and maybe bluffing a little bit. And like Mark said, eventually you get to that question of, am I better off retreating here and giving my opponent three points instead of risking it and trying to maybe giving up six? Yeah, it's very much, I think people call it a Yomi style of game, that idea of like just looking at an opponent and trying to figure out what they're thinking and what they're going to do. Uh, because once everyone knows the cards, which is pretty quick, easy, it's an 18 card game. I think, I think it's an 18 card game. Uh, once everyone knows the interactions, it's a question of, okay, do they have this card in hand? And if they do, how does that change my strategy? Do I risk them having it in hand and doing that kind of calculation? So I think there are, there are a number of this style of game that I've played, and I think there's another one a bit higher on the list. But this one stood out to me because it remained interesting after I had kind of understood the cards well. Um, so it was interesting at first and in seeing all the new and inter- cool interactions, but it remained interesting as this kind of bluffing poker style game, Yomi game, after I had understood roughly what all the cards were about and then could try to figure out when to hedge my risk and when to go for it, when to retreat. And those calculations became more interesting. Yep. Great game to play with one other person while you're quarantining. Yeah. Good, good small box game. Good one to dive into, I think. Yep. Um, But that's number 100. Number 99. This is actually one of the farthest falling games. It dropped 67 total slots 24 what I'll call net spots. Star Wars Armada. And I think it fell just because we haven't played it in a while. And I don't know, maybe not playing it and not seeing like the novelty of all the cool ships, it dropped in my mind a bit, but I don't know, it, it just dropped down. Yeah, I got to play with the Super Star Destroyer with a friend out in Seattle when I was visiting maybe last year. And uh, that was super cool, and I still love the tactical battles, but it is definitely an investment to get it out and build a fleet and play it through a scenario 
I actually have a, a small ship sitting in a box somewhere behind my computer screens uh, that I got in some kind of sale. I got it super cheap, so I just pulled the trigger. So here's the question, Mark. If we got the ships out and displayed them on the top of our game shelves, would you rate Armada higher? I might. I mean, the visual appeal of that game is so significant to... I mean, it's still a very good game mechanically, but you can't deny that a lot of the fun is that you're piloting these awesome Star Wars ships and going pew-pew and shooting them <laughs> um, and rolling lots of fun dice. So pew, pew, uh, indeed. this could move up and down quite a bit. I, I'm not surprised it ended up moving down uh, as much as it did just because we haven't played it. I, I don't think we've played it since the last list came out, so that's like two, two and a half years. Um, but, I mean, that's how it goes. It's still an excellent game, and uh, yeah, I think... There were talks that we were going to start up like a little mini ladder league with, because uh, we have another friend who has even more ships than we do. We have kind of a joint collection. Mm-hmm. And between our collection and his collection, we could pull in a few other people and have a little league going, but that never panned out. Yeah, we wanted to do like a four person round robin ladder style league or something. But then I left to go to some random well, country right. for a couple fault. months. I mean, it's sort of my fault. I mean, you have to go travel the globe. You guys were still perfectly capable of playing, but yes, I was not here to, you know, give an extra impetus to play. Um, yeah, but maybe yes. Yeah, in in the in the healthier futures, I would I would like to do that, and I think in that case, Armada would jump back up. Let's see your number ninety eight mechs versus minions. Uh, which I actually have a copy of now, thanks to um, uh, a friend who let me have his copy. Once he was done with it, it didn't really move much net. It dropped 41 raw spots, but there are 43 games added to the list in front of it. So not much to say there. Interesting game. Same with number 97, Sushi Go Party, which didn't move much net, which we played a few times online and is fun, although I do think the... Just the base game will get old fairly quickly. And the party implementation with all the extra cards that you can mix in there is is really required for this to be the ranking it is. Is the what are the expansions? Is it the puddings and the chopsticks and the um soy sauce? No, I think if I remember correctly, the Sushi Go Party adds like an additional 200% more just cards and you mix them in like the oh, menu. Oh, okay. So it just adds all that variety, which I think is needed. It's it's a very, very well thought out drafting game, but the, the dynamics, at least when I played, you know, like five times within two weeks online, I'm like, okay, I've seen this out. Um, so the party version is definitely the one to get. And I don't think it's even that much more expensive than the base game, even though it has like three times as many cards. Yeah, it's fun. Number 96, Friday, my, I believe so, I think still my favorite solo-only game, super fun. Uh, I bought a copy for my mom because she was interested in some solo games, but she said she hadn't learned it yet, so maybe I'll teach her. She's visiting at the moment. Number 95, going back to Game Right, the local game company, Forbidden Desert, um, which in all those, these last four have roughly stayed in the same spot relative to, you know, excluding the new games. Then we move up to number 94, which is an indication of a major thing that has changed since the last list, which is that I've played a lot more 18xx games. Number 94 is 18 Max. Um, yes. The Mexico version of 18xx. If you were to chart, again, the kind of the basic uh, descriptor of these 18xx games, is it is it more financial shenanigans or is it more operational? Mex felt pretty middle of the road to me when I played it. It had some shenanigans you could do, but the operations were were uh, important also, and it felt approachable in terms of a new 18xx game. It wasn't particularly complicated, but it had some really cool narrative stuff going on. You, I know you've played it more than I have. I think I only played it once or twice. Yeah, it's definitely really fun. Made a very positive impression on me the times I've played it. It's got a couple rules in there that kind of guard you against some of the harsher edges in 18xx games. Oh, yeah, that's so right. There's rules like you can only buy one train around and the four trains, which is kind of the tipping point between non-permanent and permanent trains, 
they have a rust round, so they get to ro- run one extra time. And there's variants that remove some of those things, which make it a much harsher game and more likely to end in bankruptcy. But the main ver- or the standard version of the game is mostly about getting good board position and tokens into and out of Mexico City uh, and kind of planning your train routes uh, or your train progression, I should say. And the biggest kind of financial shenanigan is around how the companies obsolete and merge uh, together um, to form the national. So it's it's very good, worth checking out if you like 18XX. I think all the permanent trains are named after a real train. And so there's like a, a one line of description or a name or a something on there, which is fun. And uh, there's definitely design in the board and some of the rules that... Uh, and I think some of the initial privates, which is very historically focused, um, which always makes those games fun. Yeah, and I really like, again, the, the narrative nature of like knowing the national is going to come out, knowing the, it, ha- it comes out of Mexico City, right? It, uh, yeah. Like, which one it is is related to who has reached Mexico City? If I remember, it spawns uh, when you buy the five train, the first five train, mm-hmm. and then it will... It's going to start in Mexico City, but people, you go around the table once and other than the person who triggered it, everyone else has an opportunity to basically donate one of their companies into the national to kind of get it going. And so timing that and trying to figure out who's going to trigger it and which company might get folded in is one of the big kind of inflection points in that game of how well you do. Yeah, and in the in the time I remember playing, I'd, I I was new to the game, and everyone else I was playing with had played quite a few times, and I think the national ended up being way less significant or way less powerful than normal, and everyone around the table was surprised by that, like it had never happened before, which was a cool indication to me that you know even though those those guys have played probably close to ten times there was still surprises and interesting stuff around the main pivot point of the game. It wasn't an 18xx game where like front like early decisions did everything like like determined everything and then you just kind of play it out. It was a game that felt like there was like a an early game and an end game that you were shooting for and trying to balance out, which I found super cool. I like that kind of thing where there's a big pivot at the end that creates a dramatic moment rather than being like okay, this this person's running away with the lead. We can end it. And that's how the game ends. Yeah. Um, I prefer the 18XXs that have a bit more drama to them. But it won't be the last 18XX on the list. Moving up to number 93, a new game to the list, but one we have talked about the podcast a couple times, and that's Democker, uh, which we got to play at a convention back when conventions were a thing, which was interesting. It was quirky. It had some stuff rough around the edges. We tried the, the friend we were playing with who knew the game. Uh, house rule or i don't know if they're official or but we tried to smooth out some of the rough edges there have since been a new edition released which i think had some controversy about which rules it allowed and which didn't but the core of the game was so cool and interesting around these very weird elections in germany that uh, it had to be on the list it was such I mean, even as like a novelty of like one of the first big heavy euro games i thought it was really f- cool it was just fun to play it was, it was a fun experience yeah absolutely but we've talked about, I know we talked about this quite a bit after that convention, so go back and find that episode if you want to hear more. Number 92, a party game, also new to the list, Stay Cool, which I got to demo a basically final version of at PAX Unplugged. It is a party game about multitasking in your mind as multiple people are throwing tasks at you, like trivia uh, and math things in certain things you have to spell out using these these letter dice i still need to grab a copy of this because i think our group would have a lot of fun with it but it was like a party game built for me because i love that kind of mental multitasking stuff uh yeah i found it a lot of fun i don't know would you would you like that kind of thing it's i think it's a love it or hate it game uh i'm not sure i kind of think i would hate it but i might like it I, i don't i don't really know yeah, I think you were, you described playing it with people as everyone in the room was super stressed and hated it, but you loved it. The person, the guy next to me, another reviewer, um, 
absolutely hated it. And he, when he, it was described to him, he said, oh, I will hate this. And then as he was laughing and messing up, he said, I hate this. But he also had fun. So, I mean, in terms that he was laughing and having a good time, but I, I think he legitimately hated it. Again, it's if you don't like that particular skill set, uh, you know, it's like space alert, right? You're, if you can't handle the stress, which is perfectly legitimate, uh, you're not going to like the game. Yeah. So it's that kind of game, but in a party game uh, format. And I think it's really neat. Number 92, Stay Cool. Number 91 is a game that we played again at a convention. Wow, that seems like such a long time ago. Such a long time well, ago. This, this one was a long time ago because it was not one of the more recent conventions. It was, it was a couple years a generation ago. before that. I, I think, think it was soon after the last podcast. But this is one of those games I look back and I think that was just a fun game to play. Like, oh, yeah. I hate using the adjective fun, but certain games you're like, eh, it was just fun. Uh, that's number 91, Role Player, uh, which is a Euro game about creating slash upgrading an RPG character using a bunch of fun dice. There's some bidding, some I think some bidding, some drafting. Uh, yep. You're trying to upgrade your stats. You're trying to hit certain combos and armor, you know, collecting s- sets of armor, all the kind of fun yeah. RPG is it, stuff is but it, in a Euro game. Is it dice drafting or is it that you roll dice, then you have modifiers to adjust them? I think they use was, dice in like every conceivable way. There was things where you'd like roll dice and then if it was a six, it could go in your six slot and that would do something. But you had powers that could, you know, plus minus one or flip a die or combine it with something else. Or And then you're trying to arrange the colors in a specific way on, yeah. on top of the numbers. Yeah, there's a bunch of different dimensions of stuff going on it just took the idea of like dice and like just threw the book at it like what 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 can we do with dice um yeah it was just fun and i heard the expansion is quite good um it's it's a fairly big expansion and i think it turns it into a cooperative game or at least a cooperative end game or something like that i think there's a variant at at least or there's there's like a common boss but there's a winner that emerges from it i don't know i've heard good things about the expansion but the base game was I don't know how much depth it has to it, but it had, like, each individual part of it, like, each section of all these were, were just good ideas they put together into a game that created a, an enjoyable experience. So uh, that's why it's on my list. Number 91, Role Player. Number 90, staying roughly in the same relative space as it has been the same net space. Keyflower, which we haven't played in a long time, but I have fond memories of it. We've talked about that one before. Moving up quite a bit in my estimation, so only down eight raw spots, gross spots, but up 31 relative to its peers on the previous list, you know, not counting the new games, is Three Kingdoms Redux. Yeah, I want to play this again. I thought about, and I'm like, I think this was more original and unique than I even realized at the time. Having workers that are all unique that all have special powers i mean the three player thing is is interesting that it's only for three players it had very different strategies you could pursue and the i don't know how many if i've played many worker placement games since that one which were as tight and interactive with the other players like could be really brutal in terms of blocking spots and harming the other player in that brutality balanced by the fact that it had to be three players. I think it was really cool. And the art is fantastic in that game. Yeah, I think great. it took everything good about a, the three player dynamic in a game and just absolutely nailed it in a worker placement, asymmetrical, lots of interesting strategies. It was great. Yeah, so that's one I, I, I sh- maybe should pick up a copy. If we can get a third person to commit to playing it with us... The problem is our, our game nights have turned into like four to five player nights, so a three person game is weird. Um, I don't know, but it, it moved up in my ranking. I didn't realize it was that severe until I actually did the calculations that it only moved down eight total spots, but not counting the new games, moved up 31. Moving on to number 88, a brand new game to the list, what I like to call Ugly Terra Mystica, the Gaia Project. You mean Space Terra Mystica with cool plastic pieces. I I don't like the look, but I do concede that it has some cool ideas in it uh, and perhaps some strict improvements to Terra Mystica. I don't know if they're worth 
the added rules complexity. Because I would say, even though it is very much a sequel to Terra Mystica, I think it's a solid half step more complex. Yeah, I... It adds, like, at least one new resource, maybe two, and then, like, everything on what is the temple track in Terra Mystica now has, like, an additional bonus to it. It was a lot to wrap my mind around, even though I had basically played 80% of the game before. Yeah, weren't there more? Weren't there, like, six temple tracks, two, instead of four? There were a lot. It was a big chunk of it. There's a lot going on. It was a good game. I enjoyed it a lot. Great fun. Uh, if you've decided that you've played out Terra Mystica, check it out. But yeah, definitely a heavy game. I And I do know, I think it is perhaps the favorite or one of the favorite games of Isaac Childress, designer of Gloomhaven. I, th- I think I saw him tweet about this lately, that he's maybe it's his favorite game, but he thinks it's an absolute masterpiece and one of the greatest designs ever. Um, so, I mean, he's played it a lot more than I have, so maybe that says something. I would not mind diving into it, but... I do think it is substantially uglier than Terra Mystica. <laughs> yeah, I don't agree. Like, I enjoy Terra Mystica, but I don't find the cardboard art as compelling as you do. And the space spaciness of Gaia Project definitely stands out to me. Yeah. I mean, I do like space, but I, I also like the Terra Mystica theme of, like, like I don't know, all the random mystical creatures. I mean, we're nitpicking here. We think both of these games are fabulous. Yeah, but I think it's not to say that they're interchangeable. I think Gaia Project is noticeably more complex. Moving down to number 87, a game which dropped 18 net spots, 56 total uh, gross spots, Pandemic Legacy Season 1, which is to be expected a drop because you can't really play it again, really, and get the same experience. It was a fun experience. I think um I think this it's might fading fading in time with me. Yeah, I think this might also be hurt a little bit by the fact that season 2 just didn't quite live up to the hype. At least in the couple months we played. In the yeah, in the season first couple months. Season 2 got played. uh smacked down by Gloomhaven arriving in the mail. Yeah. And we haven't touched it since. Yeah. And then and then my legacy experiences since then haven't been that great. I did not find Charterstone very good at all. We are in the middle of playing My City by Reiner Knizia, which is, a, I don't know if it will work well as a legacy game, but it is a fun game. But the promise that Pandemic Legacy had in terms of this new style of game, I don't know if the expectations, I don't, no game has really lived up to that in terms of a real, like Gloomhaven, it's technically legacy, but not really. It's, they could have done Gloomhaven in the same style as like a Descent, you know, other campaign games without stickers. But I mean, Legacy never really panned out as a major player in the industry, as far as I can tell. I missed a couple of them, but yeah, I mean, the, it's, the, it's fading in time. The promise of it, uh, maybe that brought down Legacy Pandemic. Yeah, if you haven't played it, it's absolutely worth. Oh, you know, it's still the I, every game on this list is uh, very much worth playing for sure. Yeah, but I, I, it has been a couple of years since we played it, and we've just, you know, like you said, we've played a lot of games since then, and nothing else has really kind of lived up to that legacy spiritual successor sort of. Yeah. Um, mantle. So. Yeah, which I think is fine. I don't think we need legacy. I think it was fun. It was a cool kind of shock moment in the industry. And uh, I think it's okay if it kind of fades away from there. Or maybe someone will really change it up hard. I think it needs a really big, hard shift, something more, much more experimental. Um, and maybe that will bring Legacy back to the forefront. Anyways, moving up to 86, the little Japanese or Korean, or I don't remember, I think... Japanese, I think. Is it Japanese? A filler game that took all of our hearts... For no apparent reason, Goat and Goat. <laughs> I mean, let's I mean, be it real. is a good game. <laughs> Who doesn't want to climb mountains with goats and try to collect the biggest herd? I'm going to move over to look at the YouTube comments because I know Mark is watching and he thought it was merely okay. I disagree, Mark. Goat and Goat is a delightful little filler card game with some really cool mechanisms. It's not complex. It has a good amount of strategy. It's fundamentally a kind of a push-your-luck game. And 
it's just clever and it's super cute and fun to look at and fun to play and looks fun and and it's just happy like it's a happy game and it's called goat and goat which is a great game oh okay mark has revised he says goat and goat is good not top 100 good i'll take that i can see if people don't want to put it on the top tiers but for what it is i think it's really really darn good Another another convention game that's been, you know, eternity ago. <laughs> Not that long ago. But it feels like forever It feels ago. like a long time ago. <laughs> oh, man. Number 85, new to the list, CO2, Vital Lacerda's shared incentives game. I don't want to call it semi-cooperative. It's a, it has a single shared win or loss condition. Otherwise, it's a competitive game. But I found it very, very interesting. Yeah, it pushes you with the game theory common loss condition like Archipelago. And then you're trying to, you know, be do the most for the environment without letting other people out to you. <laughs> yeah, and, and to note, we played the new edition, but we played with the original rule set. So not the cooperative new rules. Yeah, we played competitive. Uh, which... By everyone I trust who has played the new rules, they all say the original is better. So I'll, I'll be content with that. I don't really care about it being a cooperative game. I thought it was super interesting that it was a competitive game that you have to like play on other people's spaces and, and not only care about the loss condition, but really pay attention to what other people are doing uh, because the calculation shifts so much by what other people do. Yep. I think the co-op scenario could be interesting in as like a puzzle to solve. Mm -hmm. um, but I have a hard time believing that it would be a better game than the competitive, which was just so interesting. Yeah. Um, so CO2, not going to be the last Vital Lacerda game on the list, I can tell you that much. Moving up to number 84, I don't actually, before I get to that, I don't think I mentioned, I'm going to do three podcasts for this top 100. So we're, we're plowing through the uh, 100 through 67 here, which is why we're going a bit quicker. But number 84, another new game to the list, Irish Gage uh, from Tom Russell. Did I say <laughs> is that his, that's his name, right? I didn't mix him up with another... Right? No, yeah, you're right. It's Tom Russell. It's Tom Russell. I had that moment of doubt uh, when I said his name. Sorry, Tom. Uh, Irish Gage from the creator of Irish Gage, Tom Russell. <laughs> along <laughs> if you with, don't get that joke, along, go listen to the podcast where he was on. <laughs> along with the creator of so many other weird games. <laughs> the joke being that Irish Gage is by far his most normal game <laughs> and his most successful, apparently. Uh, so... Uh, we're joking that he should advertise all of his very bizarre experimental historical games as from the creator of Irish Gage, uh, just to annoy people. I think it's a funny joke. It's, it's probably yeah. the most inside baseball joke I have. <laughs> That's a very obscure joke. <laughs> yeah, you have to. It's it's yeah, it's just very specific to him and his games yes um, but this, anyways the, irish gauge is a lot of fun irish gauge is a cube rail game uh which if you've played uh it has similarities to 18xx in that you are playing as an investor and own shares of different companies and operate the ones you are the president of uh it operates very differently in that you don't own trains and there's no train rush or progression of those it's all about laying track in the form of these cubes which is usually exclusive to you in most of these type of games and then making deliveries between point to point and um, getting money for your share value and then buying more shares and trying to have the most you know value at the end of the game so it's definitely interesting i like this one we played it it's pretty quick under an hour uh from most people if i'd you're, say if yeah you're keeping, 45 minutes to an hour if probably. you're keeping a good pace if if you think um, train games are intimidating this is the kind of game you should play because it is quite simple. I would say it is medium light in terms of rules complexity, but there's a lot of interesting depth there, especially on after your first play, because the opening auction is pretty important. Yeah. Um, but fortunately, it's it's quickly over, and in an evening, you could easily reset it and start over and get a good feel of some of the really cool stuff we see in even the more complex train games. Yeah, I think we played it three and four players and both worked pretty well. 
Oh yeah, yeah, it works great. Um, and the new edition is is looks fantastic. Oh, yeah. It is it is a prime example of where train games can look amazing without losing that like really hardcore functionality that the more complex ones need. And Eno Tool just knocked it out of the park with the look of, of Irish Gage. Um, and I think the second one in their in Capstone series of train games has been released also. And they announced the third, if I don't, if if, if I remember correctly. So I haven't played those games, but uh, this is just a delight to play. Super fun, quick, like everything's right out there in front of you, the incentives, the calculations, and it's just a matter of outwitting the other players. Number 83, a game we've talked about quite a big bit in the past, uh, remain somewhat in the same relative spot as before, Robinson Crusoe. Don't need to say much more about that. Number 82, The Son of Dr. Esker's Notebook, which is my puzzle-solving game for my top 100 list. I think it's better than all the exit games I've played. Um, I haven't played any unlock games. I think I played one other kind of, I'll call it off-brand puzzle, escape room style game. But I, so far, I think this one has the strongest puzzles. It is very indie. It's a guy selling it by himself. If you are a fan of these exit games and you want to support like small creators, this is the series to go to. There's two of them, the Dr. Esker's Notebook, and then this one, the son of Dr. Esker's Notebook, which I think had slightly better puzzles, but they're both worth, worth seeking out. It's just a deck of cards, super clever, not really, the first one had maybe one dud puzzle, the second one had stuff that was complex, um, stuff using language that I don't see in the exit games, probably because the exit games are trying to be more international, but I really like how he uses words and language and in the structure of language in his puzzles. It, it, some really, really good stuff, but, but quite hard. Did you ever get around to playing this one? No, I haven't played this one. I think I, I gifted it to someone and then you said you wanted to play it and I felt bad. <laughs> yeah. You had like just mailed it to, someone I, I don't know who and i was like oh okay yeah it's also a game you can buy play through and then gift to someone else because you don't destroy anything like with the exit games yeah. i do like the exit games but i think that the level of puzzles creation puzzling whatever what do they call it in puzzle land they the people like the the act of making the puzzle there's a verb they oh, use setting setting the setter uh here uh is uh or the setting is is quite a bit better, I think, than the exit games. As fun as the exit games are. Yeah, as an aside about puzzling, Mark and I have both been doing a lot of Sudoku and Sudoku variants over the next... Specifically last... Sudoku variants. Yeah, especially variants uh, over the last maybe six months, inspired by the excellent YouTube channel, Cracking the Cryptic. They're very good. Very good. So shout out to them. Yeah, if you want to hear a calming British man describe, get get <laughs> exceptionally excited over puzzle cleverness. Unreasonably excited about And Sudoku. say like old timey exclamations. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's what you didn't even know you needed. Go to Cracking the Cryptic on YouTube. It's very fun. And the... The creativity of some of these Sudoku variants is outstanding. I love it. Yep. Uh, regular Sudoku, you take it or leave it, but some of the variants and some of the stuff they've done there with, with logic puzzles is very cool. Number 81, going down a net 22 spaces, 56 overall Viticulture. There's an OG game for us. <laughs> a what? An OG game. <laughs> OG, yeah. That was one of the earlier games I bought. Um... And I think I've just played better Euro games, more interesting Euro games. Like, I like the excitement of Viticulture. Uh, I like that it is a bit more random, a bit more crazy. But I think my mood now is for something a bit crunchier if I'm going to play, especially with, with the expansion, like a two and a half hour game. Yeah. Um, I Everyone raves about the Tuscany expansion. I don't 100% know if it's worth the added play length. I think it's very good, but I agree, and sometimes I might prefer to pay, play the base game in an hour over the Tuscany in two, two and a half. Yeah, um, I mean, an hour would be pretty quick, but still, um, I, I get. I, obviously, I think it's a great game, but it dropped relative to that to to the other games it was competing with before, just because I think my mood has shifted away from what Viticulture brings. 
Moving on, number 80, Triumph and Tragedy. Another game that moved down quite a bit, 18 net spots. I think just because I had played it a couple times recently, uh, right before making the last list, and I don't know if I've played it since. I think this is just one that I got to play again, like Armada, right? I just got to play it again, and then I'll be like, oh, now I remember why I had it so high before. But I do think it's very good and interesting, and I love the kind of macro take on World War II. Uh, that doesn't only focus on military. Yeah, this is definitely high on my want to play list if we ever have three people interested in a serious war game, um, which is somewhat of a niche uh, group composition. Yeah, another three player only game. Yeah, um, so that makes it a bit harder for us to get to the table because either it's two or four to five people um, and we don't always have three people who are into a uh, whatever four hour war game or whatever this would be um but it's definitely high on my want to play list and would love to get it back on the table yeah and i haven't i don't think i've done a proper review of it so we should shoot for that number 79 basically play saying in the same relative space carcassonne carcassonne is great we all know it we've talked about it before (laughs) let's move on to three new games in a row number 78 coimbra which is kind of the most prototypical, what I would call Baroque Euro, I think is the, the term that we're trying to get coined, uh, of the last couple years that I've played. Uh, it's got dice drafting, it's got a little map, it's got uh, some collection stuff. You're basically just getting points here and there, but the dice drafting is super, super cool. Did you play this one? I don't think so. I feel like I've heard you talk about it enough that I, think, I am I think like I played fooling myself into play, remembering that I played it, but I don't think I ever did. It's got a really cool dice drafting thing where it's somewhat similar to Pulsar, where um, taking high numbers comes penalizes, or taking better numbers penalizes you, taking worse numbers uh, can help you. There's lots of little considerations about what dice you're going to draft. The rest of the game is kind of like stuff on Feldy point salad stuff. Okay. But the dice drafting is very, very strong. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what kind of saves the game. It also has an excellent art style, a uh, pleasure to look at. And a good kind of midway euro. Again, that Baroque euro, which I do enjoy quite a bit. Um, I think a lot of the people who have been using this term on Twitter... Uh, do not like that style of game, but I think it's a good term, and I like that style of game. So that's Coimbra at 78. Can you explain what you mean by Baroque Euro? I don't so think Baroque I've heard Euro that. is like the Vital Lacerda, Stefan Feld style of Euro, where it is about lots of parts. It's about many different ways to get victory points, it's not quite like point salad because maybe the victory points are very tightened, but there are a lot of interlocking, like separate but interlocking mechanisms. Okay. As opposed to like a much leaner economic euro. Like, uh, did you play container with us? Uh, yeah. I would call that like an economic euro. It's very lean and trying to get to like very tight. Um, or even something like uh, El Grande would be a different type of euro where it's much more about player interaction and it's much tighter, more elegant rule set. And then the third kind of Euro, I would argue, is like the German family game. So like we talked about Carcassonne, King Domino, uh, you know, the much lighter um, uh, family games that are coming out of, out of or traditionally come out of Europe. Okay, That's how I kind of picture Euro games right now, is like the lean economic game, the family game, and the Baroque. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, 77 is a game that I don't even think it has been released yet, but we got an advanced copy and played it a number of times, and I found it quite interesting. That is Magnate. I think the subtitle's First City or The First City, but Magnate, uh, which is, I believe, the designer's first design, and it is very, very strong. Is this that real estate one where you yes. like the, it's all about adjacency and stuff? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you're trying to build up real estate um, on this board, and it's about, it's strongly about, like, turn order and trying to capture the right renters of your buildings. There's a bit of an auction thing going on. 
and it's it's what I'm talking about, like the economic euro. There aren't a lot of mechanisms at play, but everything is like smashing the the players into each other on these really thin margins. Um, I th- I thought it was very very fun and interesting, um, and especially strong as like a first design. It's very good. Yeah, I did, I remember not enjoying it and being frustrated at the I think the randomness and I I think I tend not to like games where bidding for turn turn order is expensive and opaquely important um i like that though it reminds me it gives me fond memories of power grid yeah i don't know i just i was frustrated by this game and trying to figure out what to do with the different resources and how to bid on stuff and feeling like i got the short stick on a bunch of randomness i don't know i i don't remember having a good time playing this one yeah i think you would like it on an on an additional play um it did get much better for me as i played it i played it three to four times i think and each time it got better and, and new richness was opened up and i was able to see and predict things like farther out in the future right that prediction horizon expanded this is that one that had like the inflation track and then the market crashes at some point yes that was a cool me- mechanism. I forgot to mention that. That's like a big mega mechanism for the game where you're trying to predict when the game will end slash accelerate the end of the game and then like sell everything off right before the market crashes, which I uh, is really an awesome idea. I loved this game. So be on the lookout. I don't know if you can pre-order it. It was on Kickstarter a while ago, and I think it's going through the process of getting the printing out. Uh, but I think should be out fairly soon. I haven't checked on it in a while. But whenever, if you have a chance to, to uh, take a look at it, I would highly recommend that. Number 76, Kalis 1303, another new game to the list. I finally got to play Kalis, albeit the new version, um, which, as I understand, people generally like, so I don't feel super compelled to play the original. Were you there when we played Kalis? Did you play uh, I don't remember playing this game, no. Was this another PAX East game when the year that I didn't go and you and Matt went and played a bunch of games there? Yes, it okay. was. Well, there you go. So Kalis is super cool worker placement game where – have I even told you about this game? I don't remember. No, I don't think – So it's, it's credited with – the original one's accredited with having invented worker placement, but it's a worker placement game where you're manipulating this dude on horseback along – so like all the actions are on a path, basically. Okay. And certain things you do in that will be resolved during the resolution phase, which goes in order of the path, will push this guy up and down. But only the workers below him on the path, only those actions will ever trigger. And the actions further up the path are better and stronger. So it's got this cool push your luck thing going on where you're doing this tug of war with this neutral character to decide what actions actually happen in the game. Hmm. Very, very cool. Brutal in some cases, if you push your luck too far Is it- or if people like gang up on you, I've never played a like pure Euro in quotation marks with so much interplayer negotiating. Hmm. Is it like the Puerto Rico thing where an action means everyone gets it? No, it's literally worker placement. Okay. It's just you resolve the worker placement in a certain order up this path. And once you get to the, the horse, the guy on horseback, I can't remember his name. The Kalis. You the stop. Team. Like the, the round, the action round ends. And all the other workers oh, come back. There may I be see. some compensation if you don't get an okay, action. Okay, so you can place ac- place workers and knock it to do the action based on Correct. the position of this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Very, very cool. Like Like straight up negotiating in this game. Which was awesome. I really want to play this again. This is one I think if I if I got a copy or got to play it a few more times, it could go up much higher on the list. Okay. Um, lots of promise there, and I see why it's so well loved. Number seventy five, moving up relative to other games from last time on the list by sixteen spots, uh, down fifteen overall is El Grande. I know you didn't like this game very much. But I think it's great. I think you overrate this game. I think it's fine for what it is, but I don't think it's the greatest area control game of all time. Well, I don't either. Um, but maybe I think I've enjoyed area control more. There's a certain other area control game that has moved up on the list that we'll see mm-hmm. in two episodes. Spoilers. Uh, spoilers, wink, wink. But I do think El Grande is super fun, and I have 
lots of fun memories with it. I think it's very it's very tight, compact design that I like. Number 74, a product of our attempt to go through every coin game in order, hitting one that I hadn't played last time, a distant plane. This was definitely the best of the ones we hadn't played. I by I a would pretty agree, good margin. <laughs> by a pretty good margin. I think this if if someone were to ask me what is like not the form, but like the prototypical coin game, what gets me coin without a lot of frills, but gets the core experience, I would immediately say a distant play. Yeah, I think the first two games, maybe Cuba slightly more so than Colombia. Um, or was it Andy and Abyss and Cuba Libre? Yeah, yeah. Um, are a bit simpler, but they are just a lot the end game reduced into a lot of stalemate in both yeah, of those games. This game for us. was just a much more interesting dynamic interplay. All four factions were interesting. They had different incentives. It wasn't a 2v2. It was a, you know, 1v1v1v1, <laughs> <laughs> which is just that that essence of coin where you, you know, form alliances of convenience with someone where you find ways to overlap incentives and hurt each other less than you hurt the other people. But um yeah, this game was great. Uh, highly recommend. If you want to get into coin, I'd say start with this one for sure. Unless one of the other ones has a theme you really like or an sure. area of history you really sure. like. But absent that, um, purely from just a gameplay perspective, this is the, the, the place to start. coin game. Yep, I, I completely agree. And it's it has all those aspects that makes the series great without a lot of extra rules complexity. It's it's a conflict I actually do know a little bit about, compared more especially compared some to uh, some of the other games. So maybe that that gives it a bit more. Uh, you know, I recognize some of the cards and such, the names on the cards. That might give it a bit of a boost. But uh, from a, from a mechanical standpoint, it's like the most pure coin. That's also great. I also love. Well, I'm not going to spend too much time on coin, but I just love the thematic parts of these games where. The way certain actions or factions play out, you just understand, yes, this is exactly what they did or yeah. would have done, and this is why. Um, and just the incentives for the coalition to, you know, have a big turn of creating stability everywhere and then pulling out all their troops right before the end of an era mm-hmm. is, <laughs> yeah, it's just, uh, it's so, it just captures that conflict so well. Yeah. But not, not the last game on the top, uh, nope. not the last coin game. Or the last game on the top 100 list. We will be talking about more uh, in future podcasts. Next, we've got three games that basically stayed in the same relative places before. And three games we've talked about quite a bit. Uh, number 73, Power Grid. That old classic keeps sticking around. Oh, can I just ask, would you put this in like the German family euro? Or would you put it more in the point salady or kind of power grid yeah i put this in the economic the economic so the tight economic tight hero economic. yeah okay. it's too heavy for a family game and it's too too uh streamlined, <laughs> streamlined for the baroque sure. yeah okay tokaido i would put in the family game uh which is number 72 um even though no it's a euro game yeah delightful game i love it number 71 the third three player only game i've mentioned on this section of yeah, in the like top 100 in the last 10 spots or something yeah <laughs> churchill uh which i like slightly more than the other two although i would say three kingdoms maybe could pass it if i played it more but i have played churchill more and it's basically in the same space relative to you know not counting the new games as it was before i think it's super fun occasionally frustrating but in that good kind of war gamey way <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then number 70 we get to the final new game on this episode number 70 is brass birmingham uh of the to the reprint of brass lancashire and brass and, and this one kind of a new variation on that i would say this is i i, I spoiler alert i like the other one better but Birmingham is still strong enough to make it to number 70 on the list. This is the one with the beer barrels. This is the one with the beer, which I think is cool. Another little resource. What I don't like as much about this one as the other one is that one of the new progression, building progression tracks seems exceptionally weak. And maybe I'm missing something and I fully concede I could be. I've only played this one a couple times. You're talking Um, about boxes or pottery? I don't remember which one I'm talking about, which is its own problem. 
Uh, maybe they're both weak. I think the boxes. Boxes, uh, they just feel worse to build than anything else. Yeah. And there might be a game where you could win with them if everyone else was competing super hard on the other things. And it's that dynamic of do the stuff, do the thing that other people aren't doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but the numbers are just worse, like all the way up the track. And yeah, they this, seem just worse. And there's kind of this weird sawtooth where the numbers, you the the levels you want to get to are too expensive for what they give you and what they cost. And I just, it's just a little bit off. Yeah. And again, maybe I'm missing something because it's hard for me to believe that something that a game that was presumably worked on quite a bit. I mean, the original brass has been around a long time, 15 years around something probably 12 to 15 years, maybe. And so the idea of releasing a sequel of sorts that has such a fundamental error is just like, giving point value to something that's not good seems weird to me. So I fully admit I could be entirely wrong. I know there are a lot of people who actually think Brass Birmingham Birmingham is the best of the two games. And I would be fully open to playing this one some more, digging into it and maybe getting my mind changed. But as it stands now, I still think it's very good. And it is at number 70. Yeah, I enjoy it. And there is... I think a bit more variation game to game in terms of where the merchants show up and where you have to send certain resources. It does have a bit more variation uh, and the beer thing is cool. Yeah. I I think those parts are good and make it maybe a bit more interesting than um, Lancashire, but the feeling like one of the tracks is just less efficient is... yeah. Uh, it's a drag. I think also some people like it better because it is less cutthroat than Lancashire. That could be. It's a bit it's a bit more open, a bit more do what you want, not as you can't get blocked out as easily, I think, uh geographically on the board. So maybe people like that, but I love we'll we'll talk about Lancashire later. Um, spoilers. <laughs> spoilers. Uh but I, I do I like how combative it is. And finally, for the last three games on our list, we got three old standbys that we've talked about quite a bit. Number 69, Harvest, which actually moved up relatively 12 spaces, down only 17 overall. A traditional working pl- worker placement farming game in a small box. It's it's a pleasant, enjoyable game. I like that it's small box. I like that it still has super interesting decisions. And I also love that the... The, the variation in starting, like, powers, right? As yeah. very severe unique, starting, unique powers starting powers that really guide your strategy. And that little twist really makes the game. Yep. And the poop components. And there's, yeah, there's poop. Number 68, basically moving relatively not at all on the list, Lost Cities. I still love it. Yep. Fun I, fact. I, I just, taught my mom it. I just recommended this game to a friend, like, a week ago. Nice. Yeah, Yeah. I taught my mom. We played it online during the pandemic a few times. Just a fun game. Uh, In fact, uh, her and I, now she's visiting here for a few weeks, are working on a game design together for her idea of working on it together. And it is actually borrowing some interesting stuff from Lost Cities. There you go. Um, She didn't realize it, but I noticed it when we were discussing what we were doing. I'm like, yeah, it's a bit of Lost Cities. So I think, yeah, the push your luck aspect of Lost Cities is, is... Ideal for a quick game like that. It just works. Reiner Knizia is a genius. That's another new thing I think I've discovered since the last list. Like, I've always liked Lost Cities, but I've played a few more Knizia games. And, yeah, he's uh, a genius. And he, incredibly uh, prolific. His, his reputation is well-deserved. We'll put it that way. Not the last Knizia game on the list. And finally, rounding out another game we've talked about quite a bit. Moved up 11 net spots, down only 18. Roll for the Galaxy. Uh, which we played a few times online when we were all quarantining when the pandemic got bad. And I think this really is one of the games online. that was better online. Yeah, I mean, because you can play it in like 15, 20 minutes you online. You play it faster. It does all the counting for you. There was like one edge case that annoyed me about the implementation. Um, on, on Arena? Board Game Arena? Yeah, on Board yeah. Game Arena. Um, but yeah, it was it was good. Yeah, like I said in my review, a very highly strategic game, one you want to dive into a strategy hardcore, and then if it doesn't work, you just play it again. In those kind of, There's definitely a space for those kinds of games where you can pursue a strategy, 
due to bad luck or just bad implementation or bad turn order or whatever, maybe you don't, it doesn't pan out or maybe it wasn't a good strategy, but it's short enough that you can dive in again. And just because there's randomness that can blow you out doesn't mean it fails because the game is so short, uh, but still quite meaty. A lot of interesting decisions, just a really good blend there. That's the games we're going to be talking about for today's podcast. Again, we're going to split this up into thirds. So next podcast, we'll go number 66 through 34. The biggest chunk of new games will be in this one. Over half, I think, are brand new games to the list. We played a lot of really good games over the last two years for the first time, and I'm excited to tell you all about it. Uh, This list here, we got a lot of solid games. Um... So what does this list cover? All, are these all eights? Do you get an eight and eight and a halfs? I believe these are all rated eight for me. Okay. I think we hit eight and a half towards the middle of next list. Um, again, eight. There are a lot of eight games. Games that I've given an eight out of ten to, and uh, yeah, these are all eights. Um, some a little bit more than others. Uh, but I'm not going into more finely detailed ratings than eight and eight and a half. Uh, it's already too, uh, too minute. I mean, it's, it's, it's a frivolous thing on my side, but it's a frivolity that I enjoy. So I'm going to go with it, but yeah, there we go. hundred through 67. Any surprises, Orion? Not that much. Um, I think Magnate maybe is the biggest surprise to me. I know you liked it, but I didn't like it. And I was a little surprised to see it at whatever in the mid seventies. I think I kind of was um, as well. I thought maybe going in, I saw that I'd rated an eight. I considered it. I thought, no, it's still an eight. And when it shook out that it was kind of mid middle of the list, I was like, okay, I, I was thinking maybe it would end up towards the bottom, but it ended up pretty much toward the middle of the eights. And I do enjoy it quite a bit. And I think again, especially as a first design, I think I, Designer can correct I mean, me if I'm wrong. It, it may be like a second design, but I think it's his first design that he's publishing. It's a very strong game, and it has. It's not afraid to do what it wants to do. The idea of having an end game in a strong, like economic euro, where some people are just going to straight up lose because they push their hand too far. That's a bold thing to do in a game. Mm-hmm. Um, Lacerda did it with a skate plan, and some people got upset, um, which I think you know came in know. front that, of this game. But I that, think that was that wasn't the problem skate I plan, had with the skate plan. No, that wasn't my problem. <laughs> I had the skate plan. I thought that was maybe the best part of the skate plan. But this game does a similar thing where you can just straight up lose in the end game, uh, even if you're in a decent position before. And I think that kind of bold, risky move is is what I want to see, and it's what I'm I'm rewarding maybe a tad more than I have in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had forgotten about Gaia Project. It feels like that was two years ago we played that. Um, I think it was only about one year ago, but yeah, really? it does feel like two years. Could be. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I definitely read Son of Dr. Eskers as Son of Dreskers, and that sounds like some sort of vampire game to me. <laughs> like it should be set in Transylvania battling some relative of Dracula. Nope. Um, and it's definitely, you know, not at all that. But I think uh, next list, it won't be a ton of surprises. I mean, you know what games I like, but next list, there'll be a lot of new games. A lot of new games on the list. New to us, not necessarily new games. In fact, there's one that's quite old that is new to us that's on the next list. I'll let Orion sit there and ponder that one for a second. But for all you listening, thank you so much for listening. I'm so glad to be back podcasting. It feels like a weight off my shoulders now that I'm actually sitting here talking in front of a mic. Thanks to Mark who stuck around and threw in his commentary on the list. I'm glad he thinks Goat and Goat is good, even though he's a bit baffled by its inclusion on a top 100 list. Uh, that reminds me, if you'd like to support this show and support what The Thoughtful Gamer is doing, go to patreon.com slash The Thoughtful Gamer. You'll get to watch our live stream recordings as well and can add your own comments uh, as we go along. Uh, if you want to see more from The Thoughtful Gamer, go to thethoughtfulgamer.com. I'm also on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and hopefully we'll be ratcheting back up the activity as more games get played and as more games hopefully get designed for the patrons who are on the $5 tier. They will get access to exclusive 
game design stuff after my mom and I do a bit of testing. I'll write some stuff up, show them where we're at. That's one of the rewards there. Um, and I've got a couple other designs rattling around in my mind as I get more active back into board gaming stuff. So that's something you can look forward to if you are on the $5 Patreon tier. I think that's all I had to... What, was there anything? Oh, oh, iTunes. I, I've completely forgot how I end this podcast. The podcast is in places you find podcasts. Yeah, there you go. The podcast exists. Um, <laughs> oh, no, we, but you're already listening to the podcast. You know how to find it. Rate it. That's what I want you to do. Rate the podcast. <laughs> and, rate, uh, rate and Rate and review. Download. Yeah, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Yep. Maybe there'll be some YouTube videos. I'm not going to commit to anything there on videos yet, but the potential's there. Um, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next time with part two of three of the top 100 list. Goodbye. Peace out. <laughs>